Um, and I want to give you a short glimpse what the evening event will be about. Uh, so what we pre have prepared is a short clip from uh, Rebecca Lane, the uh, woman who is uh, giving the concert tonight. This may be uh, not just to inform you what she is doing, but also like a little bit to wake you up. Okay. <laughs> And she impersonates also a very strong character as a woman. ojos de los enterrados se cerrarán juntos el día de la justicia o no se cerrarán. Estamos aquí para reivindicar la memoria del pueblo indígena. Estamos aquí para decir aquí en Guatemala sí hubo genocidio. Ríos de sangre en los que lloro la tierra después de tanta masacre en tiempos de la guerra y no pienses que esto se quedó solo en los ochentas tantos los arrasados de una forma tan cruenta, tan violenta la manera de quitarle agua al pez. El ejército asesinó una y otra vez. Como piensan desde el odio, hacen todo al revés. Defendiendo intereses de los ricos, tal vez. Usted no se haya dado cuenta, pero el exterminio a pueblos mayas tuvo intención de genocidio. La Sofía lo decía, y que matar mayoría. Qué casual que en estas tierras hoy haya minería. Fusiles y frijoles para reeducar. Son campos de concentración para latinizar. Ríos no lo niegues, te vamos a juzgar ¿Cuántas veces necesario voy a testificar? Claro que sí, si sí hubo genocidio Lo sabe este cuerpo porque en él no hay olvido Intenta borrar la historia, yo escribo la memoria Escucha esta canción, es sentencia condenatoria Claro que sí, si sí hubo genocidio Lo sabe este cuerpo porque en él no hay olvido Intenta borrar la historia, yo escribo la memoria Escucha esta canción, es sentencia condenatoria Es genocida, no soy Nunca podrán imponer amnesia histórica en nuestra memoria colectiva. Yo estoy luchando. Los genocidas no somos nosotros. Qué cara tienen que ellos que no hubo genocida. Sí hubo genocida porque el genocida es Río Sol. El pueblo Ishil ya te llevó a juicio. La jueza Jasmine Barrios dijo él sí lo hizo. Durante días escuchaste el suplicio de gente tan valiente que se niega al olvido. El poder logró que se anulara el proceso. Empresarios dinosaurios forzaron el retroceso. Lo que ellos temen es que ya perdimos el miedo. Renacimos de la tierra con todos nuestros muertos. Claro que sí, sí hubo genocidio. Lo sabe este cuerpo porque en él no hay olvido. Intentas borrar la historia, yo escribo la memoria. Escucha esta canción, es sentencia condenatoria. Claro que sí, sí hubo genocidio. Lo sabe este cuerpo porque en él no hay olvido. Intentas borrar la historia, yo escribo la memoria. Escucha esta canción, es sentencia condenatoria. Genocidio no es ya solo una lucha de nosotros en el país, sino que también es un reclamo en el mundo que se juzgue y se condene a los genocidas en Guatemala. Sí hubo genocidio. So I all, uh, invite you all to uh, participate in tonight's event. Um, uh, and now, uh, I just for those who weren't here yesterday, my name is Wolf Gruner. I'm the director of the Center for Advanced uh, Genocide uh, Research at the Shaw Foundation. And it's my uh, pleasure to um, hand over uh, to the first panel. Um, Susan? Oh, here you are. <laughs> so Susan Fitzpatrick is, uh, was, um, has graciously agreed to uh, chair this panel. And uh, so please, I hand over the mic.
Good morning. Um, my name is Susan Fitzpatrick Behrens. I am a professor of Latin American history at California State University in Northridge and am very happy to be here today. My research focuses on Catholic missionaries and indigenous communities and I, pu I published a book on that topic in Peru, but I'm currently working on the issue of the interrelationship between foreign policy, international aid, and Catholic missionaries and the development of Catholic social, political, and religious networks in Guatemala in the period leading up to the armed conflict. So I'm, I'm kind of before this, this very violent period. It is my great, great pleasure to be able to introduce two scholars with very long commitments to Guatemala. Um, we're going to start today with Catherine Nolan Farrell, who is an associate professor of history at the University of San Antonio in Texas. Um, she published a book on constructing citizenship, transnational workers, and revolution in the Mexico-Guatemala border from 1880 to 1950 in 2012, and she is continuing to work on issues related to the border. Um, currently, she is doing research that examines the movement of Guatemalan campesinos into southern Mexico and the U.S., both as economic immigrants and as refugees. Um, today, she'll be focusing on one aspect of that, which is the, the Guatemalan refugee refugee crisis in southern Chiapas from 1980 to 1984. Please welcome Catherine Nolan Farrell. Gracias. I'm not sure I can compete with what went on. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm that energetic, pero pues ni modo. Um, so this talk, I was joking around with Susan earlier and, and um, Betsy Conafal, who um, is kind of my compañero de cuarto. And uh, there's about 25 different iterations of this paper because it's part of a, it's a, part of a book chapter. So I've been trying to figure out what's the best one um, to deliver today. So kind of based on some of the discussion that has been happening um, in the, over the last few days, what I wanted to concentrate on is to look at this issue of the Guatemalan genocide from Mexico, through the Mexican lens to some extent, but also from the lens of the Guatemalans who fled into Mexico. And I know we've talked a lot about this issue of um, resistance. And one of the questions that I want to address in, in the big picture is, is fleeing, is surviving a form of resistance? And I think if you would talk to some of the refugees in the communities, or now they're called the Los Ex Refugiados, um, there's an awful lot of debate even amongst themselves about this. So I wanted to start here just to give you guys a, a, an image of um, kind of where we're at. So a lot of what we've been talking about so far has really been focused in, the, um, in Quiche, and this is actually in Huehue. Um, and down towards San Marcos. Um, so the Zona Paso Hondo is, um, it's kind of what's unique about it in many respects within um, Chiapanecan um, studies, if you will, if there is such a thing. Um, there's no defined border, okay? So this picture, I was, this is the Mexican community I was in at the time, and I had been interviewing a, a, a couple of families there, and they, one of the women there said to me, well, you know, we've been talking about this, but why don't we just go to my tia's house? I said, well, where's that? Well, it's 15 minutes más allá. It was actually across the border. And they just crossed it. And what's interesting here is there's no real marker. Usually when you see the border, you know, you got the line with those orange balls on it or whatever, you know, this is the border. No hay nada. There's nothing there, okay? And so in, that's kind of the, the, ge the geography, the physical landscape here, okay? So we come to the question then of how did Mexicans understand this issue of this mass migration, and that's what they'll call it at first, um, this mass migration of, um, of uh, Guatemalans into their country. So. First of all, you have to understand that Mexico at this time has no legal way to recognize a refugee, okay? There is no legal structure. There is a case for political asylum that you have to apply for individually. So these conventions, the, the 1967 UN protocol that defines uh, refugees, uh, you know, you can read up there, the uh, person who's got a founded fear of per, uh, persecution, 
that's really what they're going on. This 1984 uh, Cartagena Declaration is much more expansive, but we're talking about 1979, 1980, 1981, so this is even before there's that legal framework. And what I found really interesting when I started to really look into this, they don't even begin, the UNHCR doesn't even define what a migrant is until 2004. So when we start, and you can, I, I'm from Texas. Actually, I'm not from Texas, but I'm living in Texas now. Let's make that distinction. Um, so, <laughs> for so many reasons. Um, so, uh, so this idea, so if you're in Texas and you're listening to the rhetoric about the border, right, and they're talking about, oh, you know, these, these migrants are coming in, these economic, they're going to, you know, this taking our job, the whole Donald Trump thing, if you will. Um, you know, this rhetoric really didn't have, a, didn't have a framework, a solid kind of political, um, uh, legal framework, until after much of what had happened already within, um, within Guatemala. So in Guatemala, what they, what they end up starting to have, um, really since the 1880s, and some would say even before, is Los Braceros Guatemaltecos. Okay, they have mass migrations of Guatemalan workers who come into the in, into the coffee zone of the Soconusco, and they work on the and they work on the fincas. Now, this whole other I got to leave that stuff out about. Ooh, how do they decide if they're Guatemalan or Mexican? At this point, this is in uh, the 1970s. This is a, a a clipping from a newspaper from 1979 where they did this big expose. Oh, there's still Guatemalans coming in. It's like, really kidding? Um, so you can see up in the first corner there, these are the people who are taking the tires across the Rio Suchiate. This is a, uh, this one guy doing a labor contract. You know, these are the, the barracks, the galerias, uh, where the, um, where the Mexican, or the, I'm sorry, the Guatemalan workers stay. And so this is, develops this rhetoric along the border by, to some extent, Mexican labor leaders that say these Guatemalans are undercutting our wages, they're taking our jobs. Um, there's one interview where they're taking the bread of the, out of the mouths of Mexican children. You know, they're very dramatic about some of this. But on the flip side, there's also really strong economic and social connections across this border. Right? That border that doesn't really exist, so you can just walk to your tia's house 15 minutes away, right? And so this is um, about a, a year later. This is from 1979, and this is the, uh, one of their traditional um, fairs that's right along the border. Uh, and you can see these are all the, these people from both sides of the border. They're, they're playing in the middle of the Rio Suchiate, which is, you know, the border region, or is the, the river that marks the border in that part of... Um, of Mexico, nobody's looking at documents. Nobody's looking at who's who. There's this big um, kind of, you can see right here, it's kind of like this, uh, how do you call it, like a sandbar or something in the middle. And supposedly, this is where you go, and you can just bargain for whatever you want. So it's like a free, free trade zone, if you will. It's like whatever you can get for this, you know? And so this is, but this is a part of the kind of flexible history or the flexible identity, if you will, that marks so much of this interchange between Guatemala and Mexico on this part of the border. Okay. So what part of the border am I talking about? Kind of goes from here, actually not all the way down here. This little where that dotted line starts, that is actually still part of the refugee zone. And then it goes all the way up, down, up through kind of uh, the Petén. So, I love this. This is from the Mexican um, uh, military uh, uh, defense uh, archives. And um, I love how they have the helicopter and the rebeldes, right? Um, yes, we need to illustrate this. But essentially what they're trying to show is that the Guatemalan military is actually moving in, and this is obviously not to scale, but I would want to think that they wanted to put this over in Quiche, and then also in Tenango. okay? And so that just kind of gives you an image, at least, of where we're talking about on the border, okay? Um, this is my uh, 
one of my favorite maps because this shows the area that I work in. Um, this is the uh, uh, Zona Pasoando in Tiscao. And all of those little, it doesn't show up super well here, but all of those little dots are refugee communities. Okay? It's, it's massive in terms of when they initially try to, um, uh, try to begin to deal with this border issue, they're, they're actually not talking about Guatemalans. What they are is talking about Salvadoreños, right? Because there's actually a huge population of Salvadorans who come in. And the Mexican, it's called the uh, Mexican Commission to Help Refugees, roughly, um, called Comar. Uh, they're actually initially established by um, President Lopez Portillo in uh, June of 1980 to deal with the Mexi or not to deal with the Salvadorans, not to deal with the Guatemalans, okay? And so... The rise of all these campamentos is something that, to some extent, the Mexican government isn't prepared for. Okay, so I got I mixed up my my slides here. What changes? There's two events that significant uh, that that kind of mark, if you will, this fundamental change within um, Mexican thinking about the idea of economic migrant versus refugee versus political asylum. This is across, I think this is, I um, can't remember the name of the river here. These are Guatemalan migrants slash really what they are is refugees who have fled from uh, the, some of the army massacres and they're being helped out of the boats by Mexicans who are on the, on the sides of the river there. Okay, so this is a this is a pretty mass influx. This is not one or two people coming in seeking asylum. So this is one of two cases. The first was actually in um, uh, my name here. It's Arroyo Negro in Campeche, and there's 400 some odd families that uh, they actually initially say there's 500, then it goes down to 470, then 425 um, of families who cross, and. The Guatemalan uh, kind of uh, public uh, spokesperson for the, um, for, the, for the army says, they're not, they're not refugees. These guys are guerrilleros, right? Son guerrilleros, pero son, but they were full of women and children. And it's kind of a little bit hard to see in this photo, but a lot of them are women and children. So the... Guatemalans are saying, oh, yes, you know, these guys are dangerous. Well, this gets out in the Mexican press, and it creates an uproar. And eventually, it, it creates enough of an uproar that Amnesty International gets involved, and they call on the Mexican government to not deport them. But it's too late. The Mexican government deports the 470 families back. At that point... The Guatemalan military takes control of them, and there's an interview that's put in the uh, Mexican press that says a couple of the people who were interviewed said, oh, yes, we were duped by the guerrillas, right? We, we, we were forced to go from our homes in Huehue all the way through the Petén up into Campeche just to discredit the Guatemalan government. Gotta love it. Okay. So... That is like kind of the first big case. The second big case is actually um, from Huehuetenango. This is actually a Mexican military map of what becomes a pattern of migration. Um, the second group that comes in is about six weeks after the, um, the group that goes up to Campeche. And in this case, it's again about 400 families. Now of these, Mexican government does agree to actually here asylum cases, and it grants of the 400 plus people asylum to 46 of them. Okay, the rest are deported back to Guatemala. And when I was talking with somebody about this in the um, on the border region, we think they were all killed. Okay, and so that's kind of the the Mexican government's response. They were starting, they were like, okay, well, maybe this isn't quite adequate. And what I want to argue here is that actually, when you're thinking about genocide and you talk about um, perpetrators, victims, and bystanders, what I want to argue is that 
the quote unquote victims here, the survivors, I would argue, and to some extent the bystanders, all right, who are actually ordinary folks in Mexico, pressure the Mexican government to change their they're thinking about this mass migration, and they, they change it from being economic migration to being an, a recognition of actual political refugees, okay? So how does this happen? Well, if we go back to our, our issue of here, the boats, um, this woman, you can kind of just see her here. There's actually a hole in, in a different picture of this that didn't come out quite as well. Um, these are from the, actually from the Archdiocese of San Cristobal. They have uh, the Samuel Ruiz collection and the Fondo Refugiados. Um, so the Catholic Church is really fundamentally involved in this. And these are photos that were taken by people and then they would send, they would send them to uh, San Miguel Ruiz, our, the archbishop, to try to convince the church that they needed to do something, okay? So the letter that goes along with, with um, this photo says, we have a real problem and we want to help these people, but we don't have the resources to do so. The Mexican campesinos that are on that side of the border right, are essentially, they're not as poor and certainly they're not under the same, they're actually probably as poor, but they're not under the same level of repression as the Guatemalans are, okay? So you get ordinary um, ejiditarios, Mexican um, uh, peasants, basically trying to help out. So this is another campamento. This is one that the Mexicans helped build. Another response is actually from both members of the, the, um, uh, the catechists and stuff involved with the Catholic Church and actually just ordinary people from San Cristobal. So I was interviewing a woman um, who actually has a, a very nice business now in, in San Cris, and she said, you know, we had made friends with a journalist and he came back from the frontera and he was literally crying and shaking because of what he had seen. So my husband went down to see it, what, what was going on on the border and he came back and was so shaken. So they just kind of said, we got to do something about this. And so there was no NGO, there was no formal organization. They just went around to their friends and to the people who worked in their restaurant and said, what can you give us to help out these people? And so they also began to pressure the Mexican government about what are we going to do? Now, the Mexican government is a little bit concerned about this, right? Because there's rumors, of course, that these refugees are infiltrated by those, uh, by those guerrilleros, um, that they're actually economic migrants disguised as political refugees, et cetera, et cetera. So when they set up the campamentos, when they set up these refugee camps, what's so interesting is they actually try to set them up in the middle of a bunch of Mexicans. And the Mexicans essentially are supposed to act as a buffer, right? So this is um, uh, Cieneguitas. And you can see this is the camp. All of the, this is the frontera with Guatemala, and all of these are Mexican uh, rancheros. And uh, there's another part that's actually in Ejido. Okay, and so it's like we've got to create this buffer zone. So they're now beginning to acknowledge that there is actually a refugee crisis. This is by the end really around December of 1981, before there's kind of this mass recognition. Okay, there's another one. Um, and this is essentially kind of what happens here is the refugees themselves are also pushing. So there's and, uh, one more case and then I'm gonna wrap it up. There's this wonderful case of, of uh, uh, 138 families who come across on the Rio Suchiate, so it's, it's kind, of, kind of lower, closer to um, the coffee area. And there are four school teachers in, and, and so it, some of them were probably catechists as well. One of them says, you know, soy catequista. Um, but they write a letter to the governor of Chiapas, and they want this to be sent to him by the Mexican, whoever gets them, whoever captures them in Mexico, they know when they cross, they're gonna run into Mexican peasants or into the Mexican military. And the letter essentially says, we are asking 
for not asylum, but to be recognized as refugees. Because somos guatemaltecos y queremos que regresar, we would like to return a nuestro país, pero no es posible en ese momento por la violencia. Okay? This ends up going to the governor. And so you can see where the resistance here, if you, if you will, um, how do we understand that, how do we label uh, those people who were fleeing from the violence? They're very actively trying to push their position as refugiados, not because they per se want to settle in Mexico, but because they want to eventually be able to go back to Guatemala when it's safe, that's going to be an extraordinarily problematic issue. Because once the uh, kind of essentially once you become a refugee, the Guatemalan state automatically identifies you as a guerrillero. Okay, and so what you get instead is what the uh, what we call these comunidades de refugiados. And it is actually sometimes very hard to convince people to return. So there's one story of a woman that I interviewed in the village that's on the left here. And she said, there is no way I would ever return to Guatemala because there's nothing worse than to be an Indian in Guatemala. I would much rather be a Mexicana or a pseudo-Mexicana. You know, she's like, I'm not really Mexican but it was just too dangerous. So I asked her kind of what the, um, you know, what, what was her kind of overall message that she wanted. She said, somos aquí, existimos, we exist. You were not able to exterminate us. You may have displaced us. You may have taken our country. Um, but there's a, a, an amazing quote. It's like, you can cut off our branches, you can cut off our, um, you can take off all of our leaves, but you can never destroy our roots. Yes, it was. Okay, thank you for that really amazing presentation, um, which I think in very fascinating and important ways talks about both the refugees and also the, the legal process, right? The process in which genocide becomes kind of legally recognized, which I think also ties in with your paper in an interesting way. Um, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, do, you want to do it that way or do you want yeah. to do it all at the end? No, okay. we're going to do it. Okay. Uh, 10 minutes for questions. Would anyone like to start? Um, yeah, thanks for the uh, presentation. I wanted to comment on the question about uh, is uh, right at the beginning uh, are uh, or is escape and fleeing uh, resistance and uh, coming from Holocaust studies, there is uh, on was a discussion about it and uh, uh, there are this distinction about what means escape and fleeing. So, for example, is a uh, kind of forced emigra emigration in the 1930s uh, different from escaping from a, uh, a train uh, to Auschwitz or uh, uh, escaping from a forced labor camp? Uh, but in general, uh, I think most Holocaust scholars would agree that fleeing, escaping uh, from, um, let's say, forced measures is resistance, definitely. And then uh, most, many would also agree that also uh, forced migration is uh, an act of resistance too. Yeah, so uh, this is just from this uh, perspective of the Holocaust studies. And I, and I really appreciate that. And one of the things that was so striking to me is that that's kind of how I have come to it, is like, yes, this is resistance. But when you talk to the people in the ex-campamentos, they don't necessarily see themselves of having resisted. They, the um, speaker, um, uh, Rosalina, when she was talking about, you know, the sense of, have I done enough? You know, what's enough? And so they are just burdened by this intense guilt that had I done something different, could I have saved more people? But yeah, I think that the scholars can see it one way, but there's an also this process of how do you convince um, the ordinary folks that, yeah, you did resist. Thank you for a really interesting presentation. Um, I was just wondering if you could 
um, give a little bit more of a timeline because I when we were that was what we were sort of asking about like when it when exactly is that happening like those images like the pictures by the river with the women standing there the people on the boats like the 400 who got deported oh. the people who got accepted because the the yeah. timeline is it's really important. interesting to think about and I noticed on the map of Huehuetenango that San Miguel Acatan was there so are those people from San Miguel Acatan or they're make they so mezclados they're from different places because I know some people people from San Miguel Acatan who crossed over to Mexico and then they went back because uh -huh. I mean li the fluidity of the border is really interesting but then it becomes so feroz that they don't go back right so so, so the timeline just real briefly is is in May of 1981 is when the first large group goes into um, Campeche June 20 uh, 6 of 81 is when that first flow goes from um, uh, goes into uh, the Paso Hondo, the Zona Paso Hondo. Um, after that, it kind of becomes a free-for-all, and you start to see this almost explosion in the documents of people who are coming and going. So the community of 130 some odd who came over, that was actually in, um, I believe it was February of 1982, okay? And so the question about going and, and returning and going and re returning is a really good one because when they first come over, for example, in 1981, there are no formal campamentos, right? There are these kind of places where you can hide out for a little while. Um, and then they would go back and then they come. Now, by 1982 to 1983, when Comar and um, ACNUR, the UN Commission on, High, um, on Refugees, they begin to establish formal campamentos, that is when that going and coming becomes much more fraught because if you go into a campamento and you you get status as a, as a refugee, if you go back, you lose that status, okay? And then you become part of a group called Los Desplazados. And you have, essentially what it does is it makes you stateless. So you have no you have no government to help protect your rights. And, and in fact, one of the big problems that they talk about, um, which, God, I wish I could have more time to talk about this, is that kind of that issue of how, um, what happens to the desplazados, right? Um, and there's a lot of argument that a lot of them are some of the ones who try to go up to the United States. They become, they really become a people in between. Um, they, they have no they have no protection from, I mean, everybody, yes, supposedly has human rights, but if you're looking at how are human rights really protected, you need to have a state of some sort to advocate for you, and they have no state. So they are really kind of the, um, I mean, they become people who will work on the fincas and they never get paid because there's no need to. Nobody can make them. So, yeah. Tenemos tiempo por una pregunta más? Well, I just want to say thank you so much for your presentation. And I uh, continue in Spanish because it's Estoy. so difficult for me. Well, um, creo que tu argumento es sumamente interesante en cuanto a ver a México como bystander, porque eh, de hecho los refugiados guatemaltecos en México nunca lo fueron. Nunca fueron reconocidos con la categoría legal como tal porque México eh, adoptó la convención hasta 1999. Yeah. Entonces, hay todo un periodo de tiempo donde ellos no, no son refugiados como tal y entonces se manejan categorías legales que los sujetan a su categoría de migratoria. Yeah. Entonces, si ellos se mueven de la zona donde tienen permiso para estar, son fácilmente deportables y Exacto. eliminables al cruzar la frontera con, con México, ¿no? Yeah. Entonces, a mí me parece sumamente importante cuando estamos pensando acerca de eh, las consecuencias y los efectos del genocidio, eh, ver qué pasó con la gente que tuvo que salirse, porque fueron montones. Y, y una vez en México, o sea, el país que se supone que, que los está acogiendo y que les va a dar seguridad, uh -huh. no lo hace. No, no, no. Thank you, that's, that's so correct. It's what's so interesting to me, um, kind of picking up, yeah, Mexico doesn't 
have really illegal status. So as long as you stay in the campamentos, you're protected. But what this becomes actually is almost a place where you re, I don't want to say terrorize, but to some extent terrorize because the campamentos are harassed not only by to some extent, the Mexican military, but the Guatemalan military does flyovers. They go in and they actually try to capture people out of there. And because they, if, if, you know, if you, by any, if you're caught outside of the camp, pues ni modo, right? And so the other thing, is not only is, are you kind of stuck in the camp and you're, you're kind of easy pickings, if you will, for the military, um, once you're in the camp, you also can't leave to work. You don't have access to any land. And there's a huge struggle to get permission, your FAM3 or your FAM8, which is the first step to getting some kind of legalized status. But yeah, and this continues to be a problem. So in 2007, when representatives of the CDI, the, what used to be the Instituto Nacional Indigenista, um, they actually begin to work in this zone. They do a series of interviews, and much to their surprise, these people still have no status, right? They really are stateless. And so, yeah, it's so much so, like, they'll actually, uh, people who are working in the campamentos will say to the women, take off your traje, because if you're wearing traje, you're going to be targeted, right? You're becoming more visible to both the Guatemalan military to the Mexican military, and to those people who want to try to exploit you. And so there's a, a wonderful book that I just found, and in, in, um, it has all these children's pictures, because the, the children are trying to process what has happened to them. And they're drawing these things, you know, antes tuvimos ese traje, ahora no tenemos identidad. Wow. You know, it's a 12-year-old kid who's saying that. You know, we've lost our identity. So yeah, it's, it's, and it's still an issue that there, there is still an office of Comar and Comitán and in Tapachula. So yeah, they're still working on it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we're going to continue with our next presenter. Um, Silvia Posoco is an anthropologist based at the Department of so Psychosocial Studies, Burbeck, at the University of London. Her research interests are located at the intersections of social anthropology, social theory, gender studies, transnational sexuality studies, and queer theory. She also has a very long commitment to doing research in Guatemala. Um, and she is currently working on legacies of the Guatemalan conflict from the perspective of an ethnography of transnational adoption circuits. Um, her publications include the research monograph Secrecy and Insurgency, Socialities and Knowledge Practices in Guatemala, and she is the co-editor of three collections of essays, including Decolonizing Sexualities. Um, please welcome Silvia Posoco, Posoco pardon, <laughs> to talk about traces, remnants, genocide, transnational adoption in Guatemala. Guatemala in the 1980s. Great. Thank you. I have timed my presentation to 22 minutes, but I just wanted to eat up into that time to thank the organizers of the conference and everybody who's here and whose work I have been reading or I have been uh, learning about in terms of activist circuits for many, many years. So it's absolutely am it's an amazing event. So thank you very much for organizing it. So I, I guess i get right in because I have a lot to say and I'll try and sort of say it in 22 minutes. <laughs> so since 2009, I have been working ethnographically on transnational adoption circuits from Guatemala to the global north and to Europe in particular. It is widely acknowledged that Guatemala was a Latin American country with the longest enduring and largest transnational adoption program in Latin America. Guatemala's status as a leading sending country internationally dramatically changed in December 2007 with the introduction of the law of adoptions. Since then, the flow of adoptees has to a significant extent been suspended. And yet, the traces and remnants of the circuits of, uh, uh, sorry, and um, Yet the traces and remnants of these circuits of transnational transplantation and during the present, offering a glimpse into the transnational mov movement of children that took place during the second half of the 20th century. 
Now, I have been tracking ethnographically the remnants of the circuits, following mainly paperwork, locating formal and informal archives, and thinking about the processes inherent in many complex shifts in scale and form that are enacted in and through these fragmentary and partial ethnographic objects. Documents have potent agentic capacities, as they can turn kin into strangers and strangers into kin. I have also had to make sense of shifts from, for example, the body to paperwork from adoption file to the prospect of finding an exhumation file instead, from personhood to the inorganic, and from the archive figured as a building replete with files, subjects, and relations to the archive as a hollowed out space where all that remains uh, for the ethnographer to grasp is an act of prohibition, a foreclosure, a disavowal, an erasure. Sometimes what is left is the trace of a trace of a trace. So sometimes what remains is an imprint of what has been erased. Now sometimes, however, there, are, there is paperwork. So a detailed analysis of adoption documents filed in the archives of the Guatemalan judiciary and referring to cases from the 1970s until 2007 reveals that against the backdrop of the Guatemalan conflict, increasingly large numbers of adoptees were moved transnationally through a peculiar form of state-sanctioned legal exceptionalism. Specifically from 1977 until 2007, and therefore corresponding with the years that registered the greater number of uh, adoptees leaving the country through these circuits, as well as the harshest uh, years of political repression and post-conflict violence, specific legal provisions established that the process of adoption regulated by the Guatemalan Civil Code could be formalized by a public notary, un notario publico, bypassing altogether the judicial system and the intervention of a judge. Now, the approval of the official in the Department of the Guatemalan State overseeing all technical and procedural juridical matters could be accomplished through an act of public certification on escritura pública undertaken by a notary or notario. Now, in view of this, the law concerning the voluntary jurisdiction of notaries' operations that was passed in 1977 amounted to a structurally very significant legal technology of privatization deregulation and dejudicialization of the adoption process, which was to remain in place for over 30 years. Now, the legislation of 1977 was not really, strictly speaking, about uh, adoptions at all. It was a piece of legislation that regulated the powers of notaries more generally. However, its repercussions on the adoption process were, was, were very significant. The transference of the handling of the process of transnational adoption from the courts to the offices of notaries and by extension their clients as either prospective adoptive parents or adoption agencies established transnational adoption's legal exceptionalism, making the great majority of transnational adoption from Guatemala largely extrajudicial. The great majority, but not all, and I'll say something about those that were actually overseen by a judge. So in this presentation, I'm specifically interested in reflecting on the relations between transnational adoption and genocide. And I think of this nexus as an ethnographic effect that emerged uh, for me, really, in doing ethnography. And so a nexus that is not necessarily uh, regulated or, or shaped necessarily by legal frameworks is something that emerges ethnographically. It is produced through encounters. So it was produced as I sought to understand the operations of transnational adoption circuits and uh, the specific case, and as a specific case of a group of children removed from their families during the Guatemalan conflict came into my field of vision, my field of perception, eliciting a radical shift in perspective and inscribing progressively more clearly the relation between transnational adoption and structural as well as militarized assaults against Maya communities in Guatemala. Now, the making, this is partly about the making of militarized adoptions, a term that I borrow from Laura Briggs, and a term that connects adoptions specifically to military operations, but not just that. Now, 
a word about the documents, the adoption files, the most interesting um, ethnographic artifacts. Now, adoption files or expedientes are complex, composite, and internally differentiated documents, which at once interrupt and establish relationships. There are essential capacities, um, of all of which are, you know, of this paper, pa paperwork, that all of it is in paper form. There are essential capacities rest principally in establishing identity and enacting a change in the juridical status of the individuals concerned, at once severing and instantiating relations between, for example, the birth mother, the adoptee, and the adoptive parent or parents. Now, the task of forging relations and interrupting them rests on a discrete set of operations dependent on a, on a variety of bureaucratic practices which mobilize multiple forms of expert knowledge, especially legal knowledge, in different institutional sites ranging from birth register offices in the cabeceras municipales, the administrative centers in the different regions of the country, to the offices of lawyers and notaries, uh, their legal practices in the capital city. Now, in practice, therefore, such identity shifting, relationship making, and relationship severing operations depend on a set of written declarations endowed with performative capacities which bring forth and actualize a significant change in the identities of the persons involved and, crucially, in the nature and status of the person's relations to each other. One of the most interesting and compelling examples of such a performative declaration is the one given by the birth mother um, uh, the, and the birth mother's consent to giving up the child for adoption. And her re related renunciation of parental authority and the transfer uh, of the parental authority over to the adoptive parents. In many instances, her narrative is sealed by a thumbprint, the trace of the body pressing onto paper. That's all we have, a signature, a thumbprint. Now, the birth mother, however, is not the only voice. The adoption files are structured around the plurality of declarations in which subjects declare their relation to one another to forge or indeed rescind kinning ties. Now, the speaking subjects are indeed a crowd that includes the adoptive parents or, par or, or parents, the temporary caregivers, lawyers, notaries, birth register officials, employers, and uh, many other referees and witnesses, all intent in the act of declaring that is performative bringing into being subjects and their relations, or indeed a range of misfires. Sometimes the word doesn't do what it says. Sometimes the declaration doesn't actually hold up. Let me tell you a bit more about the misfires. Expedientes entail the latent possibilities of all manner of misfires. They signal the fragile status of the sovereign subject of enunciation and of the law, returning her to the extrajudicial and privatized site of production, the lawyer's or the notary's office. Now, fragility, ambivalence, and ambiguity are further highlighted in the numerous disclaimers. I want to draw your attention to this incredible rhetorical form, the disclaimer, that appear in the adoption file. These files are interrupted by all these disclaimers. The adoption files are, are interspersed with disclaimers, that is, with declarations whose purpose is to explicitly state that the file, document, statement, or signature is not what it is. And, uh, that's, and, that, and to say that uh, uh, what the, the thing claims to do is not actually what is being done. So there's a kind of undermining of the whole logic of the document. Disclaimers state the signatures, stamps, declarations, such as the act of regis registering of a testimony, do not constitute an act of validation of the testimony or a guarantee to the testimony's accuracy or veracity. Disclaimers explicitly undermine the status of declarations, revealing the unstable process of their production and the consequent ascription of truthfulness and coherence to identities and relations. Disclaimers mark a profound and constitutive instability or incoherence at the heart of the processes that transnational adoption documents claim to govern and the operations they purport to order. Now, in view of these, expedientes are suffused with a sense of doubt, a lack of certainty, a sort of skepticism, which touches on many of the operations the documents purport to accomplish. 
a vacillation which extends to the many speaking bodies that populate them and the nature and status of the relations among them. So in the adoption files, disclaimers are therefore symptomatic of epistemic anxieties which saturate and inter internally disrupt and destabilize the adoption file. Now, such anxieties about the status of the truth in the documents themselves invokes the conditions of possibility of the counterfeit, of the fake, whose paranoid analytical and political salience we should not underestimate. The counterfeit, the fake, is not just a matter of the aesthetics of the document, but rather of politics. It is in a being able to find the fake, the counterfeit, uh, in which lies the possibility of inverting the operations of the law and its transplanting principles and acts. It is in the counterfeit that lies the possibility of the otherwise, the things might have been different from what's stated. Okay, now the case. In 1983, at the height of the counterinsurgency campaigns in the Guatemalan conflict, a group of children was forcefully removed by the Guatemalan army from a village of internally displaced Maya Pocomchi and Maya Kekchi communities in Alta Verapaz, Guatemala. Some of these abductees were subsequently moved to Europe through transnational adoption circuits where they were adopted. Following their abduction, these children were taken to a newly established orphanage in Guatemala City, and I'm told that this is the place where they gathered where they, when, where they, when they were first taken to the orphanage. Now, the members of the religious order who founded this establishment explained to me that it was not their intention to set up a children's home, but that the members of their order arrived in Guatemala in 1972 en route to Honduras. Facing problems with immigration status and the refusal of a visa to carry on in their journey to their destination, they took up residence in a house given to them through the intercession of the maximum authority of the Roman Catholic Church in the country at the time, Cardinal Mario Casariego y Acevedo. It was not until the earthquake of 1976 that the work with children started in earnest. The crisis brought on by the earthquake that hit Guatemala in 1976 meant that from that point on, they say, fuimos recogiendo niños. We went on gathering children. From 1976 to 1981, the infants and children would mainly be niños huérfanos desamparados, that is, destitute orphans. But this was soon to change. In 40 years of operations, effectively since the earthquake, of 76, and more formally since 1981, the, the year of acquisition of legal status of the children's home, this children's home sent children to Italy, the United States, Canada, France, Belgium, Holland, and Spain. Most of the children were sent to Italy, where the established network of religious order personnel could handle the inquiries and legal processes locally. There were about 600 cases in France, Belgium, and Holland. In Spain, about 150. In France, a handful, one or two in Paris, and two in Belgium. The cases with the US were very few. The children were only given to those in the diplomatic corps. Um, uh, the embassies knew of the work of the children's home, and in the account of, uh, of those who were part of it, they would contact them and ask if there were children available for adoption. Now, the adoptive parents from the United States and from Spain would come and collect the children, but the children destined to Italy would not be collected by the adoptive parents. Rather, they would pay for members of the children's home to take the children to Italy. We have to ask about this. Uh, the Italians would not collect their children. This is what happened with a group of children from the cave that were brought in by the Guatemalan army here in October 1983. So this is an account of um, their arrival. 24 children were brought in by the Guatemalan army from the area of Coban. These children were with their relatives and they saw their relatives being killed. When the army arrived, they found 29 children in a cave. Only one of them spoke Spanish. The other spoke their Maya indigenous language, Kekchi, Pocomam, and Pocomchi. One night, the bus arrived in a camioneta. It stopped in front of our door. I still have the piece of paper. There were 27 of them because one ran away, another fell from a tree, and she had to be taken to hospital, and we never saw her again. The eldest at the time could have been 12, the youngest five. I still have the list with the names of the 27 children. An army captain brought the paperwork, La Papeleria. 23 were sent to Italy, four children did not want to go, so they grew up with us, 
we feel as if, as if they were ours. Los sentimos nuestros. Now, over the second half of the 20th century and up to the year 2007, the majority of transnational adoptions from Guatemala, we can assume were extrajudicial. However, in the case of the children from the cave, the files show that the 24 children from, from Coban were declared to be abandoned in a estado de abandono by a judge on the 27th of April, 1984. The children were issued with new birth certificates or actas de nacimiento. These documents stated that they were born in Guatemala City and that their mother and father were unknown. Mother, ma, madre y fa, madre y padre desconocido. We can think about this. A narrative that was then reproduced across subsequent documents in the adoption file. Like the majority of adoption files I've been able to study, these files took, uh, also contain numerous disclaimers. <coughs> Most notably, in this particular file, the, the disclaimer is the following. It has to do with the Guatemalan Ministry of Foreign Relations, the Ministerio de Relaciones Exteriores de la República de Guatemala, uh, which was validating the authenticity of the signature of a relevant civil servant, also states, the Ministry, the Ministry of Foreign Relations has no responsibility whatsoever on the content of the present document or the validity of uh, prior legal declarations contained in here. So none of this could be true. In adoption papers, the members of the religious order uh, handed over parental guardian to the adoptive parents, and this indeed they held parental guardian, had been given to them as, a, the, as the, those who were holding the children in the, in the children's home. Now the members of the religious order kept the files of individual children until the children left. But interestingly, they also, remarkably in my view, produced their own archive and their own files. A heavily bound, well-thumbed book gathered to, gathers together the most salient details of each case. The cases are numbered one, two, three, four. For each, there are some details. You can see that the first one, the first adoption, the first uh, enter, sorry, the, the first child arrived in the, how, in the home on the 28th of March, 1979, and then there, there were some in 1980. And then there are all of those who arrived on the 29th of October, 1983. So to conclude, Acts of certification in this context appear as tenuous and unsteady uh, as act, acts of remembrance. Perhaps this is why they seem to call for reiteration, reassertion, and reproduction. Perhaps this is why even the ethnographer is compelled to copy, to reproduce, to make sure it is all neatly written down. In this paper, I have foregrounded the peculiar capacity of the archive to reproduce. Documents in this context seem to elicit their own copies as they speak to the acts of forgery, reproduction, and iteration through which they also are constituted. The archive then displays a very distinctive property, a capacity for fragmentary and haphazard reproduction. The archive reproduced itself through impressions and traces. In many of my encounters, I was told that there was no archive, no documents. Sometimes archives that seem to hold out the promise of access to records yielded inaccessible passwords and limited materials. On rare occasions, copies were found, like in this occasion, documents transcribed and some notes preserved. But more frequently, there were only the traces of the archives, documents, and children. Sometimes the traces were not paperwork, but rather the impressions left by historical events on the witnesses. I am therefore suspicious of the effect of transparency produced in and through the encounter with a document and the promise of proof and truth the document seems to offer. I think the task lies instead in grappling with the materialization of the archive in the form of a trace of the archive. As Derrida has cogently argued, the trace of the archive is a trace of a trace for which we only have impressions. The evacuated and hollowed out archival form is akin to the ash that is left following the burning of the document. It is a presence that marks the very act of interdiction, simultaneously making the document illegible. <laughs>
the ethnographer's position in this dynamics becomes animated by a desire, a burning desire to know, but new investments in acts of revelation, concealment, and quest of origi for origins are far from straightforward. So when, if ever, is not one doing an ethnography of traces? When, if ever, is not one working with the ash that is left behind after the burning of the document? Ethnography here is actualized and entangled in chains of impressions and traces. So in this complex predicament, ethnography asks, how to account for all those transnational movements for which we only have impressions? What is an impression? What is a trace? And how do we account for ash? Thank you for an amazing paper that I'm just going to comment really briefly because I'm so struck by it. But I think that there's so much emphasis, obviously, on genocide as a violence, like a physical violence. And so Sylvia's paper in illustrating the legal, the role that the state played in constructing a legal apparatus and the extent to which not only a broad range of people in Guatemalan society, but globally were actively involved in this, I just found incredibly important and compelling. Um, so we have again 10 minutes for questions. Okay. Yeah, please. Thank you for that wonderful paper. I just have a question about the, um, in the aftermath of the historical um, clarification efforts, did, has the Catholic Church ever um, admitted or hinted at their role in um, knowingly allowing these adoptions, these almost kidnappings of, of children? To, uh, to occur for so long. That is a very complex, um, if I just stand here so that everybody can hear me. That, co that requires a bit of thinking about the different facets of the Catholic Church because we can think about um, the document As Encontrarte, which was part uh, you know, of the work of uh, the Archbishop, and so uh, you know, part of the Remy work. And that is a very important document of uh, work on uh, um, disappearing children during the conflict. And so there we can see an investment from the Catholic Church to say something about the violence. And that, I think, remains a very impo important volume. Um, on the other hand, of course, there's all this kind of very loose network of institutions. What is striking, however, is that in the current moment, uh, the access that I've had to this particular informal archive is really extraordinary at a time when, um, you know, for example, if uh, I try to access the archive of the, um, of the state, uh, of the Secretaria de Bienestar Social, and that was complete, completely inaccessible. So uh, in a sense, uh, this was granted, partly because as you can see, there is a sense in which one act, the, people acted with uh, the support of uh, institutions. The striking thing about this case is that these, these adoptions were judicial in the sense that they were authorized by a judge. So those who sent the children home, uh, to abroad felt quite safe that they were acting upon judicial processes and uh, following judicial process. And so that's quite striking. Uh, so we can only imagine all these other adoptions that took place after 1977, and those were really completely structurally privatized, um, dejudicialized processes. So the question of the Catholic Church is complicated, but Asa Encontrarte remains a very important volume. Bueno, hablando de la Iglesia Católica, yo creo que en eh, en varios, eh, varias comunidades, a veces los sacerdotes fueron cómplices también de las masacres, de las desapariciones y eh, en el peor de los casos, pues muchos de estos niños fueron violados por, uh, por sacerdotes y entonces… 
Por ahora no ha salido ningún caso, pero nosotros conocemos de casos que se han dado, eh, bueno, yo espero algún día eh, estas niñas o niños se atrevan a hablar, porque no, no va a ser fácil, principalmente porque, bueno, el papel de la iglesia es un hito como de salvación y entonces… No, no se quiere como afectar moralmente a la iglesia, pero mi pregunta es que eh, con estos datos eh, creo que sería como una gran contribución para dar con el paradero de los niños, de niños o niñas desaparecidos, porque eh, el caso de Conavigua conocemos compañeras que tienen niños desaparecidos y casi constantemente preguntan si no sabemos algo de sus niños. Pero ha sido muy difícil eh, porque eh, principalmente las, uh, las casas de, eh, de adopciones nunca dan aviso, pero también a veces las propias uh, congregaciones religiosas también no colaboran, como que es un eh, pasa a ser una información como secreta y entonces esto no ayuda a la verdad también. Entonces, eh, mi pregunta es que si estos datos, eh, ¿qué ha pasado con esto? O sea, se ha entregado al Ministerio Público, se ha entre, o se entregó al informe de la Comisión de Esclarecimiento, o sea, ¿qué que ha pasado con esto? Pero decir que creo que hay todavía una enorme deuda también de personas, eh, de padres adoptivos en cualquier parte de, eh, del mundo en que deben hablar voluntariamente. Porque eh, en, a veces en nuestras giras que hacemos, uno encuentra dentro de los europeos o aquí personas, o sea, se ve en el rostro cuando hablan del caso de Guatemala, este, cambian totalmente pues, su, su físico. Y, y para uno que puede identificar inmediatamente, pues uno lo puede asociar. Entonces, esto es uno de los crímenes eh, contra niñas y niños que todavía, eh, pienso yo, no, no está como abordado suficientemente. O sea, hoy en los tribunales se, se conoce el caso de Molina Teise. Hay otros casos pues que seguramente ya, ya poco a poco van a salir, pero son casos eh, de, de juicios y aún falta esos casos donde a lo mejor se pueda hacer ese encuentro, porque hay un duelo abierto tanto para las mamás o los papás como para esos niños que obviamente tal vez ya no se recuerdan porque viven, eh, viven bien con estudio, con casa, pero la parte espiritual nunca se puede borrar. ¿Puedo solo uh, sí, re responder un ratito? No, sí, sí, sí. Porque esa es una, bueno, es una posición muy importante. Y solo quería comentarle que, claro, yo estoy de acuerdo. Y también tenemos que pensar en el hecho, bueno, cómo vamos a trabajar esta cuestión de las adopciones transnacionales, las cu la cuestión del genocidio. Y por eso tenemos que pensarlo un poquito más ancho, ¿no? ¿Qué se borra con un documento de este tipo, no? ¿Qué se ha borrado? ¿Qué se ignora? Se ignora todo, ¿no? Algo se está borrando, ¿no? Y se está borrando algo que tiene relación no solo con familias, sino con comunidades. Porque a veces ya no hay familiares, porque ya no hay familiares porque los familiares murieron en las masacres. Pero bien, hay comunidades que se acuerdan del hijo de tal, ¿no? Y ahora están diciendo, bueno, ¿cómo vamos a conectarnos con esas personas que sí sabemos están vivas? ¿No? Y conocemos muchas organizaciones en Guatemala que trabajan estos temas de forma muy entregada. Por ejemplo, la Liga de Higiene Mental, que sí 
eh, busca, intenta hacer ese trabajo de conectar a, lo que están los, a los que están al extranjero con las, bueno, no solo con las familias, sino con las comunidades que bien se acuerdan y tienen un duelo permanente, ¿no? Y así que creo que quizás trabajando el tema y el nexus, la conexión entre adopciones transnacionales y genocidio, vamos a poder trabajar eso. Bueno, lo de los padres adoptivos hay que pensarlo un poco más. ¿no? Hay que preguntarnos cómo es posible que las familias italianas no llegaban ni siquiera al país a recoger a los hijos. No, los hijos se los entregaban. Es muy interesante, yo soy italiana. Bueno, tengo que pensar cuál es el, la, el, el sistema de parentesco, ¿no? Aquí hay una, un, estamos borrando todo, toda la historia de los niños que llegan al país, ¿no? ¿Y cómo es que eso fue posible en los años 80? Eso me pregunto yo, ¿no? Y son todos temas que sí tenemos que trabajar. Pero esta idea es que la conexión entre adopciones y genocidio ya no es solo lo judicial, es lo cultural, es lo histórico, es lo social, es mucho más ancho, ¿no? Es algo que tiene que ver con la memoria. No es solo una cuestión muy narrowly legal, es eh, algo que, es, que tiene que ver con juicios, ¿no? Es algo más ancho, que tiene que ver con memoria. Y, y con... Yes. Hi. Uh, well, congratulations for this. Um, we have some cases that have been coming to us because of... Uh, you know, the work we've been doing, and cases in Canada, cases in the U.S., cases in Sweden now. Um, but I do want you to know that even if the families are not interested, the kids are now older, and they're wondering where they come from. So there's a lot of things we can do. And even if the parents are dead, if we've worked in a community and we have the DNA from the remains, we can identify someone uh, in Italy that comes from that community. And yes. so I, I don't know if I have a question because I think Rosalina beat me to it, mm -hmm. but I do want you to know that this work can easily lead to mechanisms for search and to get the word out. So congratulations. Great, thank you. Perhaps, uh, can I just make a comment about that? And I think, um, you know, I'm really struck by the promise that certain, for example, scientific technologies give us about finding truth. And I always think about the fact that even when we find truth, there might be DNA connections, that still calls for an interpretation and for kind of meaning making and for struggling with, you know, the nature of the events that led to that connection. So I'm thinking about a very broad and kind of collaborative and uh, interdisciplinary approach to, to these questions that really bring together all the different facets and that make us think about really what is the status of truth? Uh, the multiplicity of perspectives, the partial truths that all these documents reveal, and uh, all the complex mediations at stake in all these shifts in both scale and form. So that be it. Thank you for amazing papers. That was really incredible. So we now have a, a, a coffee break, uh, yeah, and we are back in 20 minutes. <laughs>